Great. Uh, great. Thanks, Lexi. Uh, appreciate the introduction. Uh, so I'm Chris Paul with the Rand Corporation. I was the, one of the co-principal investigators on this project and, and joined me. Uh, Jamie, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, I'm Jim McBeef. Uh, currently, I'm the Deputy Operations Officer for the Marine Corps Information Operations Center uh, located in Quantico, Virginia. Uh, so today we're going to tell you a bit about the efforts that went into the, the initial design, the play testing, and then ultimately the playing and execution of the Information Warfighter Exercise War Game. Uh, So some of the, the history and the background that led us to this point. So the Marine Corps Information Operations Center, which I will henceforth describe as Mackayoc, has traditionally run an exercise typically twice a year. Now, formerly that was, was known as Combined Unit Exercise or CUX, but was recently refocused and rebranded as the Information Warfighter Exercise. Now, typically these exercises run two weeks with the first week being primarily blocks of instruction and the beginnings of some, some planning. And the second week then includes more planning and uh, some exposing of the plan to friction in some way and then refining of the plans based on those friction. And it's historically involved varying levels of gamification of the friction, uh, including what for a while was referred to as opposed free play, where there were, there were two teams that both had actions and then they'd, they'd uh, have some subject matter expert based adjudication or uh, there'd be the teams would come together and, and would have cycles of action, reaction and counteraction and some discussion and then some kind of uh, uh, informal adjudication by subject matter experts. But uh, although that, that experience of the exercise was valued, there was, there was a desire to improve the, the structure and the rigor. And so uh, Jim came to us with a desire for a, a more structured and formalized war game. And he had a great initial vision. And so that is, that is what we set out to do. So that, that in, the initial goals and vision uh, remained largely unchanged. We, we adjusted some things, but, but kind of the, the vision for where we started is, is the vision for what we hope we ended up with. So this is a, a learning or training game. This is not a, a, a testing game. Uh, so the, the verisimilitude or the, the realism of the outcomes is not what's important. We're not, we're not comparing capabilities. We're getting experience uh, making plans. We're getting experience defending those plans to our colleagues and, and senior members of the staff so that you can actually get them executed. We're learning about and understanding the various different processes that have to, to be undergone in order to, to get permission and release authority and to actually be able to conduct these operations. We're trying things out and learning what happens in when, when you do stuff in a realistic context against a thinking adversary. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a, a learning game. Now, the focus is on operations and information environment. Um, Marine Corps operations in the information environment include, I believe, something like seven elements, one of which is influence select target audiences. That is the primary focus, with a secondary focus on, on deception and a secondary focus on inform, and then as allowed, kind of tertiary focus on some of the other capabilities and, and functions. But the, primarily, this is an influence game. So some of the some of the language and structure of the game bleeds in that direction. Uh, this game is designed to be played by two separate teams, planning and playing against each other, but they are not, they don't represent the whole force. So this is a force on force game where there are two, two maneuver commands, two maneuver forces fighting against each other in a, in a tactical scenario, but the the maneuver elements are controlled by a notional or higher level uh, command. They're, they're, they're either pre-scripted or controlled by role players. The, the teams themselves represent uh, variously uh, operational planning teams or red force equivalent for operations in the information environment, what used to be called an, an information operations working group. But now since the term information operations is, is arguably passe, maybe we're calling it something else, but that's the, that's the body that the players play as. So they have, 
they have control over some capabilities, but they don't control the overall scheme of maneuver. They don't control and they don't represent the commander. That, that is represented in the scenario, either by a role player or by, by scripted act activity. Uh, the game is turn-based. So players get a chance to respond to changes in the environment and the actions of the other team over time. And the adjudication process was intended to, to provide degrees of success or failure and to, to give a chance of failure by either team. And the initial vision for adjudication is something that we've, we've stuck to throughout the, the development of the game, which is a, a combination of, of matrix style debate with some, some expert adjudication and scoring, and then ultimately a, a dice-based final determination. And we'll, we'll make all that clear as we, as we press through this. So the, the game was built last year, spring and summer of, of 2020, uh, in, in close collaboration with Jim and other members of the Mikayak team, and such close collaboration that somewhat unusual for a RAND report as the, the principal sponsor point of contact and the, the brain father of the notions for this game, Jim is rightly a co-author on the report uh, and the, the documents of the rules. But that's, that's when the, the rules were built, play tested, revised, and, and then the first iterations of the game took place at Mikayak in 2020. And then we were able to actually publish the rules in 2021. So here is what we have made available. Uh, the, the rule book itself, which is, is a, a bound publication, but you can download the PDF and it's, it goes about 90 pages. Uh, and it goes about 90 pages because there are all kinds of conditional rules, optional rules, notes and cautions, uh, information about considerations when designing a scenario, information about dealing with certain kinds of, of contingencies within the game. There's, there's arguably more detail than you want to need in the rules, unless you need them, in which case it's like, oh, we have a rule for that, look on that section. Uh, along with the rule book is a, a player's guide, which is, is 13 pages, but it's really 10 pages. The last three pages are kind of a, a narrative example of play that's optional. So if, if you wanted to hand it out to players, you could tear off the last three pages and just hand out the 10 pages, or you could hand out the whole 13 page thing, but that gives players all the information that they need in order to play the game. That's supported by a dozen game aids, various different handouts for the, the role players to, to help them understand the, their responsibilities, uh, various different worksheets and scorecards for different aspects of the game, record keeping sheets, sheets to, to help structure and prepare narration about the outcomes of results, uh, a handout about how you roll dice in the game, just things to, to try to make it easier to play without constantly having to look back at the rule book. Uh, so from the player perspective, they really only need the player's guide from most of the, the judge's perspective. They don't need to make much reference to the rule book. They just need the, the reference sheet that controls their actions. And even for the, the leader of exercise control, the, the head judge, they should be familiar with the rules, but most, but most of the time they'll, they'll get what they need from one of these reference sheets. And then as, as I'll describe later, we've actually already completed the first supplement to the game. Uh, a subsequent iteration of the information warfighter exercise was, was not a tactical conflict game. It needed to be an operational level headquarters planning a uh, competition focused game, which the structure of the game was able to handle, but there were some, some different considerations some things that needed to be adjusted to do that. So in order to accommodate those, those adjustments, we released a supplement with a couple of additional game aids. Uh, just this stack of paper by itself is not sufficient to play the game. The users have to, to provide some of their own materials. The, the biggest lift for the user is there needs to be a scenario or an operational context. Uh, there's not a default scenario provided with the game materials. You have to, you have to come up with your own. Then you need uh, maps or game boards to, to depict that scenario space. Uh, interestingly, in the various IWX iterations, that's been done a couple different ways. You can see depicted here is a map on the floor, but you could have a map or game board on the table. Uh, also out at, at Marfor Pack, due to space constraints, they actually hung the map up on the wall. And instead of placing tokens on it, used pins and sticky notes and what I, I, I call pin the tail on the donkey style. And, and that actually worked just fine. So the, there's no 
there's no wrong answer as long as there's some kind of, of map that you can, you can interact with, that you can either set or attach uh, unit locations or other kinds of notes to. You need some kind of tokens, although again, in a pinch, you could just use multicolored sticky notes carefully inscribed with, with what's required. Uh, you need dice and you need an appropriate space. Uh, the space requirements for the game is kind of a minimum of, of four rooms, uh, a room for the red team to plan, a room for the blue team to plan, a room where everybody could come together. So I guess maybe you could reduce that by the count by one, by having everybody come together in one team space, and then a space for members of XCON who aren't actively engaged in some piece of the game to, to be and to, to hang out while other game functions are taking, taking place. Uh, also, you need the, the players, participants, and exercise control personnel, the cast. So the game is designed for, for two teams, opposed red and blue, teams of approximately eight to 10 players. And exercise control as de described in the rule book has 13 distinct roles, but some of those can be dual hat. And in fact, it's designed for some of them to be dual hat, like the lead of exercise control and the head judge are designed to be the same person. But there, there, are, uh, there are the other roles listed there. I guess the only ones that aren't completely clear are the narrator, the narrator is the individual who describes what happens based on the dice rolls. And the reality master, uh, which is the, the person who's in charge of collecting all the requests for information and keeping track of what truths are told to the various people who make inquiries so that consistent answers are, are held. And, and that's really important because sometimes there's a capability and no one in the room is perfectly sure how it works. And someone's going to go and look up how it works, but sometimes you need an answer immediately. So someone makes a judgment about how it works and that going forward in, in that game reality is how it works. So the reality master has to keep track of that. Uh, and so I guess I'll throw over to Jim because uh, even though there are 13 roles, uh, I think in different iterations, Mikayak has employed different numbers of people. So in most of the iterations, Jim, how many folks did you actually end up using? Well, we use probably more than that. So a lot of times, uh, so the XCON, when you go to put this, it, it is a major part when you look at your manpower requirements. Uh, depending on where we go, we, the, the ones we do locally at Quantico, we tend to get all the manpower uh, from Mikayak, though we will pull one or two from some of the visiting teams and say, hey, instead of a, as a participant, they'll act as part of XCON. When we go out, we took it, up, took it on the road, to try to get that headquarters to provide X number of people. The road tends to be a little less because of the manpower, just we have people doing multiple positions. Also, some of these times it's like the narrator. That's sometimes more of a team of two or three, depending on a person. It really depends on how many people you have available, but who can also just not show up in the game, but they're there and all the planning that goes into it so that they're, they're built into the problem, into the play, and they understand it from the beginning and you just don't throw them in at the last second. So the exercise control uh, is a manpower piece that we have to deal with. Uh, the players on the teams, you know, we have eight to 10 is ideal. Rand said that from the beginning, uh, but we've gone a little extra. Uh, we've gone anywhere between 12 and 15, uh, just because we didn't want to run two games at the same time uh, based on the number of people that were in the exercise. So sometimes the blue and red teams can get a little larger than we would like, but that's again, it's a matter of uh, how many people we have playing overall. Yeah, so that so it's flexible. Uh, you can you can run it with kind of minimal staff and people working hard and a lot of people dual hatted, or you can run kind of a maximum thing where some of the roles are are filled by multiple people supporting each other. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the watchwords of the game and why there are so many optional rules and and considerations in the in the written rules to allow flexibility in how this is going to be executed and to cover an incredibly wide range of possible scenarios. So that covers kind of the, the things you need to bring. Hey Chris, I'll so, do one more oh, if you don't mind on that. Uh, please. What I should have said earlier is you have to have the right people. So if you want a narrator, you want someone to play the three, you got to have someone with the right experience. It just can't be anyone you drag off the street. That person's got to have some background if you want to talk uh, the three or the two. So that's also part of one of the challenges when it comes to manpower. 
Yeah, no, fair enough. I, I, and, and that's something else that is, is addressed in the rules about which of the positions have which kinds of requirements in terms of experience and in terms of disposition. Uh, and as we'll talk about later, the, the narrator is probably one of the most important roles and one of the, the most difficult to fill. Uh, so the, the slide you're looking at now is the full text of Game Aid 1, which is kind of the overview of the whole game. And I'm going to spend a bunch of time on this slide and kind of walk through all of the steps in the game. So, so the default game has six turns. So that's going to be six iterative cycles through these, these five steps. Uh, of course, optionally, depending on the time available. So the, each turn is supposed to take half a day. So it's, it's supposed to be a, a three-day game. Uh, however, we've found that the first term turn is often a little slower because people aren't familiar with everything that has to happen and all the different time hacks. So, so sometimes that, that adjusts the timing. And again, that can either be that you end up with only five total turns because you spend a whole day doing the first turn, or maybe you end up taking more than three days, or there's, there's some other adjustments that are possible. But the, the basic default structure is six turns over three days following through these five steps. So in the, in the first step, uh, the team receives the, the situation and the update. So they've, they've been planning based on, on various, uh, normally it'd be road to war or road to crisis materials. They've, they've received the, their forces order of battle. They've been updated about the cap they've, they've been informed of the capabilities that are available to them. Uh, and then at the beginning of each turn, there's just a quick update provided by their role player S2, the intelligence officer, about what's going on, kind of what's what what the maneuver force is planning to do that turn, uh, where all the different forces are that they know of, where their different information related capabilities are, anything that's happening, and any injects for the turn. If something if something different is happening, if something in the context has changed that's important, they would be provided that information as well. So step two one can be pretty quick or it could in involve a, a, a longer briefing, but it, it doesn't take that much time. And then they transition directly to step two, where the teams uh, stay in their, in their planning space and they prepare the actions that they're hoping to take that turn. So based on the update they just received, and again, they have a plan, they probably already have some, some actions, but they're gonna, they're gonna pick through which of the actions they're considering that they're actually gonna try to, to present this turn. They're going to get those ready in briefings. They're going to build any of the, the necessary mock-ups. They're going to they're going to rehearse uh, their their presentations. They're going to they're going to get everything ready. Uh, one of the rules in the game is a rotation of presenters. So the the rule is you can't present an action until every a second action until everyone else on your team has a, had a chance to present an action. So that uh, everyone gets to practice and learn. Whereas in a, a real world context, you'd probably put your best foot, best foot forward and either the, the senior person or the, 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 the most persuasive or compelling briefer would always brief. No, no, everybody gets a turn. Everybody gets a chance. Uh, following step two is step three, where the candidate actions are presented for approval. So this is like given the command brief. So the role player S3 comes into the room and the team briefs the actions, the, the, the presenters who are gonna present those actions in adjudication, uh, present the actions and try to convince the S3 that they're good actions and they ought to be allowed to execute them. So that this is one of the places where the S3 plays a really important role because if the S3 isn't hard nosed and doesn't give them a hard time, either sometimes actions that maybe shouldn't have been approved or aren't very strong end up in adjudication or an action that's pretty good but could have been tightened up if the, if the S3 had really put the screws to the team uh, uh, gets through. Uh, there's also a process for if the, if the proposed action requires capabilities that aren't organic to the force so that they, they need to get something from, from adjacent forces or from a joint force contribution, something that is uncertain there's a process by which the S3 can, can make that adjudication, either just making a judgment call, yes, that's, that's likely to be approved, we're going to get that approved for you, or that's contingent on availability, we're going to roll dice and see whether it's available. But, but at the end of step three, the team knows whether or not their actions have been approved or conditionally approved. Like you, you can give that action, but you really have to tighten up how you're talking about assessment, for example. Uh, so then, Step four is the big and exciting step. That's when everyone comes together in the engagement room 
and actions are presented and adjudicated. I'm gonna talk about that in detail in, in, in the next couple of slides. So I won't go into that, that more here. And then finally, step five is a chance for everyone to catch their breath, a chance for uh, all the, the notes to get taken, for the narrator to kind of, of summarize all of what happened during the actions and the, the overall progress of the game and to cue things up to, to move into to the next step. Uh, Jim, before I move on, anything you want to say about the general contours of the game that you think is important that I might have missed? Yeah, so there are, depending on how much time you have for the game, really depends on how many turns. So over the last year, we, we, we went through two models. Our standard, our flagship model, which is what this uh, exercise at the Embedded War Game was based on a two-week model. So that the first week is all planning, and then the second, at least the first three days of the second week or up to four days, can be devoted to a war game. Uh, the other model that we have that we've used, and we're still playing around with this, was a five-day model. Uh, everything's a little more condensed. Uh, that model has some problems because you can't get as much planning and you can't maybe do as many of the turns uh, that, that you would like. Um, so we're, we're still playing exactly the model with something shorter, and that would be dependent on if another unit is hosting it, how much time they can devote for it. We have Macaque when we do our our big one in, in the fall, that, that's a two-week model, and we can go the full effort that you see here. Yeah, so again, a uh, flexible rule set that can accommodate different situations like that, and uh, we've definitely seen that the amount of time available to invest in planning has a direct correlation with the quality of the plans and the actions that come out of that plan. So the, the more time uh, teams are able to get into planning, whether that's based on read ahead or planning ahead or actual time in a, in a first week education training and planning session, uh, more planning makes, makes better actions, but that's not really a surprise, right? So uh, following the same framework, moving ahead to adjudication. So this, this on the right of this slide is the 10th page of the player's guide that describes to the players, hey, here are the things you need to brief when you're briefing an action. You can have slides if you want to, you don't have to, uh, but you do have to brief and you have to, to mention all of these things. And uh, as the, the step four summary goes, uh, there's, there's very specific time hacks. So this is where one of the other XCON roles comes in. There is a timekeeper, uh, whether that's with a stopwatch and kind of warnings, you have one minute left, you have 30 seconds left, or whether that's with a, a displayed countdown timer, uh, however, however you can get it done, some kind of, of way to keep control of time. And for many of the games, especially in term one, uh, we've had kind of a, a soft cap. If it, the, the timekeeper will say time, and even though the rules say, hey, you can, you can cut them off, they're like, okay, finish your thought. You know, take, take an extra 20, 30 seconds, finish your thought. The idea is, again, just to, to keep it fair and balanced and to keep the engagement and adjudication phase from taking hours and hours and hours. Uh, so the, the team presents the action, meeting all of these different briefing requirements. Then the opposed team gets a couple minutes to huddle, four minutes to be precise, to prepare their rebuttal. And their rebuttal has to, to take... A very specific form. It has to be three reasons why the action proposed by the first team will fail. And then when either four minutes have elapsed or when they say, okay, it just took us three minutes, we're ready to go. Timekeeper resets for two minutes and they have two minutes to give those answers. And then there's a, a structured counter argument where the presenting team quickly huddles and this time they only have two minutes and to prepare counter arguments, which can only address can the, the rebuttals that were offered by the rebutting team. So they can't, you can't save your best argument for and not put it in your presentation and save it until the end and sneak it in, haha, because I get to talk last. You can only address the things that were mentioned in the rebuttal. And then the original presenter has one minute to mention those things. At that point, uh, XCON gets to ask questions of the presenter. The, not not XCON, the judges. The, so judges, there'll either, there should be an odd number of judges. We've, we've always tried to have and, and have had three judges. 
So, so each of the three judges gets a chance. Some, uh, there's an optional set of rules for a green representative, someone to represent uh, contextual populations who can either make an observation about how they think the relevant contextual populations would respond to this kind of action or to ask a question from the perspective of, of interest in, in contextual population. But then after they've had their questions answered, the, the judges complete their scorecards. So let's move on to the scorecards. So here on the right of this is Game Aid 8, Game Aid 8A actually, the checkbox version of the scorecard. So after all of the, the matrix discussion, the judges have to get down to it and actually assess the actions. And they're, they assess three things. How difficult is the action? Uh, how well planned and presented was the action? And then who won the debate? And there's a very structured system here for doing that. Now, it could take quite a while to work through these scorecards, but the judges should come to step four with a scorecard provisionally filled out. Well, how would they know? Well, because XCON all works together. So XCON has been spying on the teams and will come back and tell the judges what actions are being planned. Or maybe the judges will have the chance to poke through the shared drive and actually see the slides for the planning of the action. So they have some idea what's gonna happen. So the S3 who approved these actions, as soon as he or she gets done approving the actions, they gotta come back to the XCON control room and say, hey, judges gather around. I've got three actions coming for you from blue. Here's the first action. Here are the details. I'm a little worried about this. Uh, here's the second action. They're gonna do this. I, I, I'm pushing on them to try to specify the target audience better. We'll see if they actually do. And hey, here's the third action. So they, they've already got some idea where the scoring is going to be, and they can continue to mark up things as the presentation and the discussion and the debate is happening. So pretty quickly after the conversation ends, they can go bam, 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 and finish their scorecard. And then those scorecard scores are combined to, to result in a target number. So I'm going to move ahead to the next slide, which gives an example scorecard. And I'm going to also throw it over to Jim to talk about how quickly new judges come to understand the scorecard. Okay, so uh, the scorecard is probably, uh, after we've worked with RAND Corporation for a long time this, I would say it's probably the second most important thing. Uh, the first one being the narration team, which we're gonna talk about, Chris will talk about a little later on. Uh, the scorecard really was Chris's idea when he said, you know, hey, we wanna have an adjudication, uh, but, but do we just, you know, Come up with out of out of it thin air, or do we have something to structure the the uh, adjudication on? So he gave the idea of the scorecard, and, and we wrestled over the questions for quite a long time, and we scrubbed it and we tested it quite a bit. I probably have the most exam uh, most experience with the scorecards, always being the lead adjudicator for each of the uh, the rehearsals and each of the IWX we've done so far. I will say one thing that when you Chris mentioned about the questions, it's important that when the teams start debating is that they keep the debates realistic. They have to do it within what they have aspects of the game. They just can't start inventing stuff. And we will see that. We will see where they'll try to get a little too sarcastic, a little too wild, and you got to rein them in a little bit in there. The other thing about the questions is that we do have really, as we're going through the scorecard, the ability to say, okay, time out. Oh, let's talk a point that, because again, like Chris said, this is a learning environment, or do we want to pin something for later on during the AR? So that's part of it. But overall, I will say that the scorecard is, it's really quite easy to use. I've had uh, folks, you know, show up, you know, like the last war game, I had to switch people out because things were happening outside the game that we had to go take care of. And they were able to pick this up uh, fairly quickly. Uh, you know, you sit down, you go over it with them, and it, it doesn't, doesn't take long for them to, to pick it up and use it. And then, like I said, we've always had three adjudicators each time. For, for the adjudicators, it takes almost a matter of one or two turns and you'll start to find where everybody's numbers, the target number there, for example, are pretty much within one, one of three differences to each other and, and everything. One thing I will say, the way, the way I do the scorecard is I do it kind of out of order. I usually use section two there. I listen to the, the initial brief. You know, uh, like Chris said, we already have kind of an idea on what they're going to be briefing or what actions they want. Uh, 
but you know, did they make the brief? How, how did it go? And kind of do the mark and I see there. And then you'll find that then I kind of shift over to, to one because I may think, well, something sounds pretty easy, but then when they get the debate back and forth, you go, well, the other side's got a pretty good, pretty good uh, comeback. And maybe it's not going to be as easy as you think. And that allows you to kind of go through, uh, you know, allowing the debate and is it hard or simple, whatever, and that you go through the score there. The third one is, is something we added because there is a, as Chris mentioned, each person gets to brief once and, and then you, you only get a brief again if everybody on the team is already briefed. And so what happens is it becomes almost a little, a side benefit is a chance for people to practice their briefing skills, which a senior person or even a mid-level person may not have that particular skill set, would have that particular skill set, where a junior person in the, in the team may not. So it gives them a chance. And then you can see when they start off, they're, they're not very good briefers, but by the time we get through a couple of actions and a couple of turns, the briefings become much better. So we wanted to give them a modifier for that. Uh, and, and that's what you see there. But overall, the, I found that we, we, the time was well spent on the card. Uh, it was good that Chris came up with the idea. And it really is within, I say within one action, the adjudicators can get a pretty good feel for the card and use it pretty much uh, almost simultaneously together with the scores. Chris. Awesome. I'm going to pause this real fast because we have a couple of questions. Um, I want to say about adjudication as well as some of the player mechanics, what they're doing. So first question is, do you distinguish between are we doing things right as in an MOP or and uh, distinguish between that and are we doing the right things, which is MOE? And do you have a collection plan? And I think uh, when Tim is asking, do you distinguish, he's talking about XCON and adjudicators. Yeah, so that's a good question. We we do consider both measures of performance and measures of affection, uh, effectiveness. Uh, having written a bunch on assessment, I cringe when people say, are we doing the right things as MOE? But that's a separate debate. Uh, so one of the things that, that the teams are supposed to, to, to include in their briefing is their assessment plan. And that's one of the one of the set of optional rules in the game has to do with uh, if the assessment plan is bad, but the action is good, there's a what we call a teaching moment there. And so there's an optional rule that says, okay, they have an assessment plan that is not actually going to tell them whether their action has succeeded or failed, but it was an action that was worth approving. And so we'll go ahead and, and adjudicate this action. But at the point at which they roll dice, they're gonna roll their dice in the dice tray, but before they can be read, the head judge is gonna leap over there and cover them with his hand and say, okay, you rolled dice, you, you did your action, you have tried it, but your assessment plan was so crummy, you have no idea whether it succeeded. And then he can stand there with his hands over the dice for a while while they talk about it. And then depending on uh, how the head judge wants things to go, they can either, you know, he can look and record what the result was. And then later in the game, when it becomes clear what the outcome is, it can be revealed. Or they can say, okay, I'm, we're going to tell you now because what happens in the engagement room stays in the engagement room. Uh, but recognize that your assessment plan wasn't sufficient to, to detail that. Another important distinction about measures of performance and measures of effectiveness is the die roll determines the measure of effectiveness. So the, the die roll and, and, and the adjudication process determines whether or not the action works. Measures of performance are actually determined as part of narration. So if an action that should succeed, like has a low target number, but fails because the team rolled the dice poorly, the narrator can choose to say that it was because of a performance failure. And in fact, if the dice roll is bad enough or under certain circumstances, they might say, okay, you were dropping leaflets, but the platform that was dropping the leaflets was shot down. So the leaflets didn't actually get dropped. So this may have been a really good action, but, but there was an execution failure. Or there could be some less catastrophic execution failure that doesn't remove an asset from the table. But depending on how we've, we've seen this in experience, uh, in, in play testing the game, depending on how the failure is described and the reason for the failure is described, that can have a big impact on whether the team tries that action again or not, right? If, if, it's, 
if the action is described as failing because there was some problem in execution, then they're much more likely to say, oh, well, crud, we're going to double down and you know, fix, our, fix what has to happen on the execution side so that this, this actually MOPs and happens, and then we'll see if it actually works. Whereas if it describes as, yep, you did it, you did what you intended to, you communicated with this audience, this audience, it just your message did not resonate with them. They're, under those circumstances, they're much less likely to try again. They're like, oh, okay, we got we to gotta come with something, something else because that's not moving the needle. So quick follow up, do you ever give teams a chance to recreate their assessment plan? Um, and if you don't, because totally respect if you don't, have you gotten the request of a team saying, okay, understand that my assessment plan was crummy, but I still want to know how that action did. So outside of the game world, can you assess this? Um. And I, I'd have to, I, I don't think that exact situation occurred, but again, it's, it's, it's a learning game. So of course, even if they had a bad assessment plan, we're going to, we're going to give them an evaluation of the plan. We're, we're going to, we're going to give them a target number and a score and eventually let them roll dice and tell them what actually happened. Uh, and we just want to create a situation where in the next turn, because this is a multi-turn and an iterative game, that their assessment plan is better. So it, it, it really is focused on learning. So Chris, I could add, so we actually do quiz them pretty hard uh, during the question part about their assessment. Uh, what we found in the last game is that we started that probably on the first two turns, and then we just realized the MOEs and the, well, really MOEs were written that were so poor that we said, okay, this part is, we, we, we've noted all your MOEs are bad. <laughs> We'll just continue on with the game. And in fact, all the games that we've done to include the rehearsals, um, we have seen the participants have a very hard time struggling with writing a realistic um, MOE. MOPs are easy. They can write those all day long. But realistic MOP based on the scenario. And so if nothing else during the AR, we, we also carry that over to the AR and have that type of discussion to how do we go forward. And so right now we are we are looking for ways. One of the things we said earlier is that you have a planning period. We often start off with some leveling briefs. And so we're trying to look for better ways to help train ourselves and how to do MOEs better uh, by at that initial stage in the uh, uh, in the leveling brief. So maybe give an example. So that's the one thing that war games uh, have, have shown us and the ones we've done is that MOEs are, are something we already knew are poor. And we think that's more of an institutional problem than it is a simple uh, exercise. And a quick question about how clarifying how the teams present. Do they present solely in front of the adjudicators slash XCON, or is the better blue team, whatever the opposition is there in the room as well? Yeah, so this is something I've actually got a slide on later, but I'll, I'll answer now. Uh, Everybody, everybody in the whole exercise comes together for engagement. So blue team briefs their actions in front of red team, red team rebuts them, and blue team offers their counter argument. It's all, it's all open kimono. And the game allows for secret action, some kind of deception. Hey, we're running a deception against that particular formation's commander. Uh, we are trying to, to get him to, to remain in place rather than moving over to this blocking position where we really don't want him. And, and they will say that's our objective. And the other, you would think, oh, great, you just gave your plan away to the other team. But there's the rule, uh, what happens in the engagement room stays in the engagement room. The action is announced as a secret action and players are reminded, hey, as part of the outcome of this action, the outcome wasn't a spectacular failure that the deception is exposed. So you don't know about that. So don't act as if you know about that. And there's checks on that behavior. There's two checks. One is, hey, the maneuver element aspects of the game are controlled by role players or by the scenario. So in real life, if you uncovered a deception, you'd immediately report it to your chain of command and tell the commander, hey, sir, you're being tricked. Well, there, there's no one to tell, you know, that, that's a role player. And if you tell that to a role player, the role player is going to be like, well, how do you know that? Oh, it sounds like you're cheating. Uh, and we have the S3s that do the action approvals. So if some team plans an action to counteract something they're not supposed to know about it, the S3 is going to say, wait a minute. What's your predicate? Why are you planning this action? Oh, because we want to we want to thwart this deception. We want to thwart this secret action. Do you know about that secret action? Then you can't do that action. So 
this was something that we had quite a bit of discussion about in the initial design of the game. Oh, do we have to have secret actions? Do we have to have secret adjudication? And we weren't sure. So we said, okay, let's try it. And we tried it. We had, we had a play test with a secret action and it worked fine publicly. Now, that's, that's still something that, that some people have some, some angst about, some concern about, but it's never been a problem in the game. Over. Also, uh, so how, we, how we've been running, especially if we have the, the game board on the floor, we have a pretty massive game board or it's just a map, uh, the map uh, of it is I have everybody sit down and the only two people, and then the briefer and rebutter, you have to stand up and they have to face each other. And then as they talk, as a brief or counter, they have to use the map in there. And they're the only ones that are allowed to speak to include answering the question. They can turn to somebody in their team for, for advice, but they cannot, that only they can speak. So it is, and when they brief, they have to be, they don't face the adjudicators, they face their opponent. And then they brief that opponent. They said, we're gonna do this. And then the opponent will say, okay, then you know, we're, they'll say, we're gonna do this and why it's successful. And then the opponent will say, well, let me tell you why it won't be successful. And that way we can, we get some pretty good sparring going on. As after what, you know, as the game gets more moving along, people get more and more into it. And, and you could see sometimes uh, uh, they can go for the jugglers at times. I believe that response actually answers two additional questions. Um, and just for everyone listening, these questions involve team actions and how fully developed they are, um, including formatted messages for target audience, payloads, et cetera, as well as um, there was a question about kind of what the back and forth is and uh, where the either self-evaluation or other team evaluation for success comes from. Um, so the, the first point about how refined the plans are, so some of that has to do with the level of analysis. So in a, a Marine Corps information, OIE, OPT, uh, it's not information related capability execution. So they don't have to produce full up ready for air time translated radio broadcasts or uh, culturally appropriate leaflets. They do, we ask them to do mock-ups so they would do a mock-up of a product and say, okay, it's something like this. It's a culturally appropriate image. Here's the message. It's going to be translated. Uh, we've, got, we've got this much time to give it to the cultural subject matter experts to make sure it's right. Uh, you know, so they get as, as close as they can, but we recognize that uh, you may or may not have a, a PSYOP or MISO specialist on a team. And so it's, it's, it would be unfair to... Uh, give too many extra points to someone who's able to get their mock-up further along. You know, you do the best you can convey the idea. Uh, Jim, you want to say more about that? How, how detailed the plans and products end up being? So that really depends on the planning time. We, I talked earlier about the two-week model and the five-day model. Uh, one of the problems with the five-day model is that there's not enough planning time. Uh, the other part, but, but going with the two-week model, for example, when you do have enough planning time. So uh, we do make them write up a complete concept of support. Uh, we do make them do a, a brief a rock drill on the last planning day. So they have to brief their plan. Red and blue do it separately so they don't see each other's plan. And then we try to bring in a senior officer for them to brief it to. So then they should have a complete plan going into it based on the phase and each turn, because uh, each turn represents a different uh, phase in the timeline uh, of the of the fight. And so they should have a plan. Now where where because the, 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 because of the dice throw, you can either have great success or great failure, uh, you know, and that's what the target number we talked about earlier. So one of the happens is when the turn's over, then you start in the next turn, step one, which was Chris talked about earlier, you get all the information and step two, you know, you get the refined information. It allows you to go back and adjust your plan for that turn. So let's say you plan for something and it did not work. Maybe I want to correct it for the next turn if I thought it was realistic. Or uh, one side had a great success. I need to counter that now. And that leaves you in that step two of the turn to, to work that so that when you get to step four in the fighting step, you can bring a new fresh action to bear on there. So yeah, you do. we do want them to come in with a, a fairly good plan, knowing that it's going to have to be adjusted uh, based on how the fighting goes through each turn. So, and Lexi, to turn to the second part of that question about assessment, 
I guess we need to, to make a distinction between kind of internal assessment versus measures of performance and measures of effectiveness of the action in the game. So the scorecards are a form of internal assessment. That's where the judges are making their assessment of, hey, how well did you plan this? How well did you present this? How likely is this action to succeed? The, the step three S3 role player adjudication of whether the action is approved or not is a, is a pretty strict go, no-go form of assessment. Uh, also, the, the matrix discussion ends up being kind of an assessment because the first, the presenting team presents, hey, here's what we're going to do. And then the, the opposed team has to rebut and they get to give up to three reasons why they think it's going to fail. And sometimes they're like, damn, that's actually a pretty good action. Uh, I think it's going to succeed, but I don't think it's going to succeed as much as you said it would because of this. But they'll, they'll admit, hey, that's, that's a good one. You're going to get effect off that, but maybe, maybe not as much as you hope, and here's why. And, and so that kind of feedback, or if they, if they come up with three really good stinging criticisms that go, oh, that's not going to work because of this obvious thing you ignored in the intelligence preparation of the operational environment, or because it flies in the face of human proclivities, or because the audience you've targeted is already going, is doing something different, and they're committed to that, that position. So you've got a way radical behavior change you're looking for, and it's just not going to happen. Uh, but there isn't a, a structured self-assessment or structured one team assessing the other team, if that's what the question was asking. So that, that dispensed with, uh, thanks for those questions. That was a good discussion. And, and again, it's hard to know with all the rich detail here, what kinds of things you're interested in. So I appreciate that. So let's turn back to the scorecard. Hopefully you've all had a chance to look at it, but you can see probably how it works, right? You, you fill it out, you listen as the action unfolds, you make your assessment. Uh, each section has a, a little translation thing that lets you turn it into a number. And so there's, you end up with, with a total of, of four numbers, your degree of difficulty score, your quality of planning rank score, your debate and discussion modifier, which then all you add those, those numbers up, add three, which is just a correction factor to, to put the number in the distribution. If there was a fourth element to score, there probably wouldn't be a correction factor. But because there isn't, and because we're, I'll tell you in the next slide, I'm gonna show you we're rolling three dice and adding them. So we're getting a, a, a range from three to 18 with a, with a mean of 10.5. So we're, we've got a nice Gaussian distribution around that. And we want to, the correction factor kind of drives the actions to, the, to about the right place on that distribution to have some actions succeed and some actions fail. Uh, and in fact, in early play testing, the correction factor was plus four. And we decided that maybe it was a more fun game if there was a very slight, if we slightly increased the bias towards success, which is why we, we toned the correction factor down to three. So this judge's scorecard produces a target number of eight. Uh, how do we get, because the judge sitting next to them might have a target number of nine and the judge sitting next to them might, might have a target number of, of 10. How do we get to which target number we actually announce to the the presenter, uh, well, we take the median. And you can do that either quickly and just get the three target numbers and say, okay, what's the middle one? Boom, there's the median, that's a target number. Or uh, one option is to look at the three component scores and take the median of each of the component scores and then add them up. And that, that protects against one judge who has a particularly dim view of some aspect of the problem. But anyway. Uh, that that's that's how it works, and so then here on the next slide is the process for outcome rules. And I've kind of already shown what it is. It's it's three dice and sum them. If you uh, tie or exceed the target number, your action is a success. If you fall short of the target number, your action is a failure. Uh, that of course begs the question, how much of a success and how much of a failure? Because the final step of adjudication is narration. And this is a hugely important step. Uh, so based on the outcome rule, one of the things that, that happens while the, the judges are completing their scorecard, either the narrator or the head judge is choosing a margin of success. So there are four margins of success, kind of the typical one, hey, if there's a typical action, it's going to have a typical margin of success. Or 
partial success likely? This is an action that is, is likely to succeed. Uh, it's unlikely to succeed immensely, but it's uh, some, some modest effect is likely or high risk, high reward or all or nothing. So one of those is, is selected. And then the, the narrator has prepared based on their understanding of the action, uh, what, what could happen. So how they're gonna describe the measures of performance, how they're gonna describe the measures of effect and what the, the target, the specified target audience does. Uh, and, and so they've, they've got their little worksheet filled out because who knows what the dice are gonna say, right? So you have to, you have, to have prepared in advance because you don't wanna be doing this just off, off the cuff. So the dice are rolled. Uh, the head judge looks at the dice and says, oh, they have succeeded by two. So then if it was a, a typical action, uh, beating the target number by two is a full success. So the narrator goes to their, their full success box and they, they tell the story, okay, hey, the, the leaflets were dropped, the loudspeaker broadcasts were made, lots of people in the target audience heard them and they have, uh, they have been mindful of it and they are returning to their homes via root, root Bravo or whatever the, the effect is. So as I mentioned, narration is a really important part of the game. Uh, it it, it kind of makes or breaks the experience. If you go through all this, this drama, we planned our action, we, we presented it, some actual person stood up and, and rebutted me. Uh, XCon asked me a bunch of hard questions. We got a target number. I had to roll dice. I'm shaking because I don't want to let my team down. I roll the dice. The numbers come up. Okay. Oh, I didn't quite get what I needed. Or, oh, I got it. Okay. What happens? And it's that chance to relieve that tension by saying, what happens? Let's turn the dice roll, the mechanics of the game, back into the story of the scenario. Let's situate an effect within the scenario context so that we can proceed. And, and having someone who can do that, do that well is key. Uh, it, this is not, just because someone is a good storyteller doesn't necessarily mean they are a good narrator. Uh, just because someone is senior and is, and is experienced, this is not a position that you award based on prestige. If you want a prestige position, make someone a judge. If, if you've got a visiting distinguished visitor, and they want to, and they want to part, make them the judge or a judge, but don't make them the narrator. Get the right person to be the narrator. Oddly, someone with game mastering or dungeon mastering experience in, in uh, commercial role playing games has probably got some of the skills you're looking for for this, but maybe not all of them. And certainly nothing wrong with having a team, you know, to help get the, the worksheets ready. Uh, to get the possibilities, but then someone who's got a little bit of gift of gab, who's got intimate familiarity with the scenario and the storyline, and I'll talk about the storyline in a minute, uh, but to get the, the narration right. And Jim, did you want to say something about how, how key it is to have the right narrator? Yeah, and I, I, may, I may come back. I'll hear what you say about the storyline because it, it, it's part, it, it is part of that. So yeah, I, I said earlier that the, the scorecard was, was probably the second most important thing. Probably this is the most important uh, thing. Uh, my narrator, uh, the first one we did, well, for the first two we did, we ha I had a single narrator. The last one, I had a team of three so they could work, you know, they, they could hear, they could start preparing. One of the narrators was a permanent briefer of the narration, but uh, it's almost, they, this team has got to be some that they're already working together prior to the idea that they're preparing. Uh, they got to be able to um, make the narration important because they want to keep it within the context of the of the scenario. They don't want to get too weird, too outlandish. They want to make it realistic uh, based on the dice throw, put meaning behind that, that dice throw, put meaning behind success, put meaning behind failure, or why it came. And that narration is going to uh, impact what they may do later as they go, like I said earlier, do I do I uh, mitigate somebody else's success or do I reinforce my success or the opposite when it comes to failure? So how the narrator discusses it and, and briefs it back to everybody. And, and really the narrator has, it really, really has great impact to how the game proceeds within making it realistic and not being in too weird. Really the narrator has two parts. One right after the dice throw, we'll give a quick 
for, okay, that dice was that good or bad. And these are the reasons why. And then when it comes into turn five, we'll take all the dice throw from, from all the actions during a turn during step four and put them together in kind of a, an overall narration to make sense of that turn. And you need a little bit of time and some experienced people to do that. And so Chris, when I have to talk storyline, I'll, I'll come back to you with you on one more on that. Sure, yeah. So the this other key concept and as part of narration is the idea of this storyline. So we mentioned this, this game, it, the context of the game is uh, a tactical maneuver operation. There are, there are red and blue maneuver forces fighting. And then as a subordinate piece of the staff, there's this, this operations, the information environment, operational planning team that's running in information effects or in information related capabilities to do things in support of the commander's scheme of maneuver. Uh, originally, when we first started conceiving the game, we imagined that it'd be completely dynamic and completely free play, but we realized, wow, if we had, if we have people from XCON playing the game against other people from XCON at this higher level kinetic maneuver level, that is confusing, involved, and not necessarily useful to the idea of training. So instead, given that the trading audience is focused at this, this operations information environment, operational planning team level, let's, let's sit back and say, okay, what is the, the likely story of how this operation unfolds? So blue is trying to do this and red is trying to do this. And over the course of a week or whatever, the six turns that we're playing, this is the likely outcome. So that is the storyline. This is what probably happens. Now, let's sit back and say, okay, we don't know exactly what actions these teams are going to do, the, the information-related capability teams are going to do, but what, what kinds of things might the effects that they have change about that storyline? So let's, let's draft kind of a left and right limit, a left limit that is, well, here's what's going to happen if things go phenomenally in the way of red operations in the information environment. The right limit is going to be, here's going to be things that, here's what it would look like if things go phenomenally in the direction of the blue team's operations information environment. And as we explored those things, a lot of those things ended up being someone's progress is delayed or accelerated. Okay, so we laid out this storyline that has blue making a certain amount of progress in each turn. Hey, but if red is really successful, blue's progress is delayed by one turn. And if red is really, really successful, blue's progress is delayed by two turns such that by the end of six turns, they haven't actually achieved their objective. And maybe there are some other kinds of things, but basically we set up this, this core storyline and the narrator has this, the narrator's, part of the narrator's job is to tell the players the, how important their successful actions are and how much impact those are having on the scenario environment without actually having them change the story all that much. So Jim, you wanna say more about that? Yeah, so just like Chris said, so what the team I have work on the story is that they have to write that. It's almost like you've published a book prior to the IWX. So they're, they're already, they've worked on it. Uh, generally what happens is, in the ones we've done so far, the scenarios, we've gotten a scenario from a different, various sources. We take a look at the sources and then we, we flush it out so that we know, like Chris said, we know the beginning and we know the end and we know everything happens. During that course, we'll make sure that really bad things happen to red and really bad things happen to blue. So both sides got to take on uh, not what they think has happened or what normally would happen, but sometimes we throw some injects in there to make it a little bit more, more harder for them to work through. And then my, my narrator, he then adjusts that storyline based on the outcome of the turns. And so by the end of the game, we may have a different outcome than what we thought we would have. But if you don't have someone writing out the storyline ahead of time in order to help guide the narration, your game can quickly become off-centered and, and unrealistic. So very quickly, we have a question about how the storyline is shaped um, and how players react to any sort of narration or uh, I want to say storyline incorporation of their of their injects etc do you see any sort of revectoring or plusing or minusing up i believe this shortening or abbreviation is vectors 
um, specifically in the influence realm? And are these factors open to the narrator to include? So I'm not 100% sure I understand the question. Uh, but the, so the, the players don't know about the storyline. They don't know about the idea of it or what the storyline actually is. And there are some things that are in the storyline that are presented as injects, like, oh, we just drew this inject card here, suck it up. But it was already, it was gonna happen. It was part of the story. And if one team is, is just crushing it and having really good actions and rolling really well and is really pushing the storyline out of bounds, we have an optional rule for corrective injects. We will throw in something to make life harder for them to push back towards the core storyline. Because again, we got the core storyline, we're flexible. We have a left and right bounds, but we don't want, you know, we don't want the game to end on turn three because blue wins. We, we, got, we got three days of exercise. We want to have that happen. So if, if, if blue is really crushing it, we're going to say, oh, okay, we're going to throw in this inject that's going to make life harder for blue. Uh, uh, so that, but that sounded like part of the question, but there was more to the question there. Yeah, I think the additional part um, was about the influence that the narrative could could gain. I'm going to go ahead and jump to another question because I think it iterates it um, in perhaps less complex terms, which is how do adjudicators assess whether a specific narrative would impact a target audience? It's a little bit of influence there. Um, and then is there a chance for emergent effects from this, like secondary tertiary effects? Ah, uh, so I... There's an, a distinction to be drawn between narration, between what XCON, the story XCON tells the players about what is happening in the game, and narratives, the thing in the information environment that sometimes you are trying to promulgate, shape, or pursue. So uh, efforts to influence the narrative as being told in a population as part of the operation. So if you have some element of green that is understanding events in a certain way and you want to change their narrative, yeah, that's, that's tricky to adjudicate, uh, but that's what the scorecard is for. Hey, what do you want? What do you want to have happen? Uh, have you identified your audience? What is your approach? How are you trying to, to change the narrative? And that's when it's, it's really good to, to, if we know this is coming, to get the cultural SMEs involved and say, okay, what do you think green rep is going to happen in this cultural context if if the blue force starts trying to promulgate this narrative in this way and they can say yeah i don't think that's going to get any traction at all or oh because they've mobilized this important historical narrative that that may resonate there's a chance that the existing narrative that's been mobilized will be overtaken by this other narrative uh, uh, so that's that so the end of the day the effect that's going to be ha have is up to the subject matter experts and the, the narrators within this scenario context. And that's, again, part of why it's important to have multiple people on team narration and why it's important to have spying and queuing on the various actions that people are planning. Because if the S3 comes back and says, whoa, hey, everybody gather around, I just approved an action that is pretty bold where they're doing this really inventive thing and they've leveraged this, this historical religious narrative and they're gonna to try to, to equate their actions to it. Uh, let's, let's get some input on this. Could this work? What would it look like if it worked? What, if, what would it look like if it failed? And, and again, push towards realism and, and leveraging expertise in the context of the game. Hey, so Chris, uh, if, if I may, I'd like to add one thing on that, on the original, the first question there on how much the, the players see. So I'll just give you an example. The, the last uh, IWX ran, uh, we borrowed the scenario from one of the schoolhouses there at, at Quantico. Uh, and it, it was a tactical lever game that involved a Marine Amphibious for, uh, Marine Expeditionary Unit, a MU, uh, seizing a deep water port against a peer adversary who was defending it. Obviously, uh, the defenders were the red, Marines were the blue. So they had the standard, uh, you know, their mission that was given, we give them the maneuver and they have to build the influence plan to support the maneuver. Ideally, those two things would be done together in conjunction at a real uh, planning team, but we don't have the manpower or the ability to have that. So we give them, that's one of the artificialities, we give them maneuver, we tell them to build the, uh, the influence plan to support that, the same for 
the red side, but going on the blue side, for example, so they know based on the story night that, hey, we're gonna come ashore at this time. We think we'll get these phases, X number of hours into the fight, we're gonna, which is we'll get to this phase line and so forth and so on, and they have their plan. And so they know that much of that's what they're playing for, and that's what they see. So they see uh, the original you know, D-Day or L-Hour, they, they see all that, and that the red, of course, knows it when they come ashore. What they, and then they can envision in their own minds what they think the end of the game is. The storyline that we've written that they don't see may say something completely different. For example, uh, in this particular one, you know, the first phase line, oh, we're going to get there in six hours. Well, we changed it so they got there in, you know, almost 24 to 36 hours because the fighting did not turn out like they think and how do they have to change for that one. So that's what they can see as they would for any plan given a mission. They don't see the storyline that we've written behind it until they get to those parts where they, they work their way through it. Hopefully that answers a little bit of that question. All right, so let's press ahead and maybe we'll get to some other questions later. I think we're getting close to the end of my prepared room materials. Hey, this is just uh, a, Chris, oh, go ahead. I mean, can I add one more? If I, I'm sorry, because you're talking about, and this was actually, I think your idea, so the dice roll, we find that in the play of the game, the dice roll becomes really a focus point. The, the people briefing, whoever, whoever's briefing, they get to throw the dice. Uh, the adjudicators do not. And that can become um, a real focal point and, and it really, really brings the team together. So one of the things we did in order to kind of just in, to make the enjoyment is, Chris kind of did, we ended, we ended with some mulligan. So the idea being is if you don't like your dice roll, each team gets one mulligan. And the team, the team league can decide when to use it. So if you know the target number was eight, for example, earlier, and you threw a five, which is really bad, you want to use your one mulligan to re throw it over. So that adds just a little bit of spice in a game to allow people to kind of get into the dice roll a little bit more. Yeah, no, thanks. We we did add that. That's an optional rule, and there's a whole bunch of of other optional rules about the frequency with which you can get re rolls, like that that you might do something in the game that earns you another reroll. So in case you have really bad die luck on an important action during turn one and you end up using your, your mulligan and then you don't have any rerolls for the rest of the game, uh, the only guiding principle for the, the awarding of rerolls is that you don't give good luck for good luck. So there's no, there's no award of a reroll for a successful action, which is basically because you rolled well. You might get a reroll for bad luck, like letting a, a, six, a failed action stand rather than trying to reroll it, or for, for something like having a really outside the box action, like even before the dice are rolled, say, wow, you know, the, the head judge says, okay, that is the, that is the most creative action uh, we're going to see this week. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to award your team a reroll because success or failure of this action, it's, it's, it's so creative or something like that, some other kind of of planning excellence reroll, like if you had an action that that had an average planning rank of one, so it was really top shelf planning, you might say, okay, that you've planned that so well, we will give you a reroll for this action only. Uh, but those are all optional rules, and I, I don't think uh, in the actual executions they've gotten too far down that rabbit hole. They've just said, hey, one one reroll per team. Is that correct, Jim? Never. Give yeah, the last one I did, I gave one roll to each team, they could use it once. And then I said, I kept it the option of giving additional roles, depending how it went. So, but each one, each one had to use their mulligan before I would even think about going to a second round. Fair enough. All right, so here on slide 15, we've just got a, a list of all the different game mates that are available. And so some of them you've, you've seen already, the, the turn structure overview. Uh, the second one, game aid two, is the, the run of show summary that just kind of lists in each step, who needs to be doing what? So kind of who should be where? If, if, if the ex-con lead who's in charge is, was wondering, okay, wait a minute, why are these guys sitting around? Oh, on my run of show, they actually don't have anything to do right now. Or, oh, they should be doing this. Let me help them do that. Uh, then a series of, of handouts specific to members of ex-con. So there's, hey, someone's going to be a judge. Here are the judge responsibilities. And, and they often have references to the actual rule book in case you want to look something up. Hey, you're the S2 role player. Okay, here's a single page summary of your responsibilities. Hey, you're the S3 role player. Here's a single page summary of your responsibilities. 
oh, game age six is a action assessment checklist because you have to make this no go no decision. Is the action approved or not? And so here's kind of a checklist. Hey, does it in include the various things they were supposed to? Uh, does it require capabilities that are, are amongst their organic capabilities or do they, do they need ac external capabilities? Just a couple other things, just kind of check off so they can kind of look at it and go, okay, yeah, this is, this is a good action or oh, this is kind of marginal. I'm not really feeling really good about this. Tighten this up and bring it back to me next turn. Or, or whatever it is. And you've already, we've already talked about the, the narrator preparation worksheet, the various different scorecards. Something we haven't talked about and probably won't given the time is the head-to-head the -head actions. So most of the time an action is uh, one team is doing something to affect the behavior of, of a target audience. But sometimes both teams are trying to affect the same target audience in ways that are contradictory. And if that is the case, we run a head-to-head -head adjudication, which is fun and has different worksheets and both both teams roll and and it, it's but that's all that's all plotted out in there too. Uh, so yeah, so that just that just gives you an idea of of uh, the some of the available game aids. So uh, one more observation to share that, and I think we've already hit on this that the, the S three role player is really important because if they don't do a good job crappy actions get presented in engagement. And this we've actually seen, and Jim, Jim, Jim can testify to this, but sometimes the judges will be like, this action sucks and was poorly planned. Why on earth did this even get to me? You know, the, the, the target number ends up being 17 or 18. And they're like, okay, yeah, your target number is 17. Good fricking luck. And, and then everyone's kind of looking at the S3, like, why, why'd you put this through? You know, this, this was a clear, the, clear one that shouldn't have gotten out of the box. Um, so in addition to that, to that gatekeeping function, uh, the S3 can also help control. So, so there, there's, the game includes a different or a, a, an option for target number of actions. So how many actions does each team get to, to present each turn? Uh, we usually either have that set at either two or three. Now, sometimes there's an optional rule that says, just say, hey, each team can present two actions each turn. Or you can just say each team can present actions, and then it's on the S3 to run the approval process such that only the target number of actions get through. So that's another burden on the S3 role player. And so if you run it that way, because uh, that, that has more of a similitude, right? In an actual operation, the number of actions you can, you can plan and execute is based on your bandwidth. How many can you plan? And based on the capabilities that you have available to you, how many of them can they actually execute that? And that there's a, there's a, a natural limit, but we don't have time for four or five actions from each team, uh, unless unless we're only running one turn per day or something. So you either have to say, "Hey, artificial limit, no more than three actions," or you don't say. You just say, "Okay, go ahead, plan actions," and then it's up to the S3 to to either end the meeting early, like, "Oh." I'm the S3, I'm busy, I have other things to do and walk out after three actions have been approved or to just get progressively more and more prickly and stickly and difficult, hard to please uh, or whatever to, to emphasize the role-playing aspect of that. Uh, Jim, any, any further thoughts on S3 role-player? Yeah, like Chris said, we have had examples where, where actions have come through and you're like, that's completely unrealistic and you will get target numbers at 16, 17, and, and they're pretty much guaranteed they're not gonna work. So we have seen that. I would say the, goal, the games we've, we've run so far, uh, this is the area that probably we have to go back and relook because it tends to be an area that, that doesn't go off as well as we want it to be. And that's normally because of the person playing the role of the S3. Now there is a check sheet, a checklist for the S3 to use, and if we force them to use that, then it starts working out much better. Yeah, I, I think there's there's a temptation for the S3 to join the team and be a senior mentor and want to be a cheerleader. And so we, we, we write on the S3 responsibility check or guidance, protect your role as a hard-nosed S3 at all times. You know, they're supposed to be tough and to give the team the business and to, to, to gatekeep. Uh, whether or not they're enforcing an action limit or not, just to make sure that only good actions go forward and to help the team tighten up their action. Even if it's pretty good already, hey, this is pretty good, you can do it, but 
you will you will do better if you tighten up these things. So that's that's an so like like the narrator. The narrator is really important. S three is also really important. Perhaps not as important, but important. Uh, moving on on secret actions. We already talked about this. So the game's has a limited double blind. Every team has their own map that shows where their forces are and where they think red is. And then there's a master map that the map, map master keeps track of where everything actually is. And then in engagement, there's an artfully composed hybrid map that has kind, it doesn't have any false information. It may not reveal everything, but it kind of shows where stuff is. But again, what happens in the engagement room stays in the engagement room. And then we already talked about secret actions and how those are, um, are shared. They are announced as being secret actions, but then they are discussed and described and debated as part of engagement. But players are reminded, hey, that was a secret action. It hasn't been exposed yet. You continue to plan as if you don't know about it. And so far, we haven't had a problem with that. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, there are, there are several different checks in place to, to prevent that from being a problem. And then final note, as, as I mentioned at the outset, there's already a published supplement for the game that, that takes what was originally envisioned as a tactical conflict focused war game and says, well, gee, what if, we, what if we need to run it from an operational level headquarters and in a competition scenario rather than a conflict scenario? And uh, they've already had play testing and one iteration of this style of game. And, and Jim, I think you've got more at this level coming, right? Right, so the, the key was at an operational level when we did it back in April. The unit we one, did it, wanted to know if they could make it a two-tiered two or a three-tiered level game. The tactical level is based at a one tier. So I mentioned like the newcomer so earlier, that's one tier. But if it's an operational level, could you get like uh, the higher headquarters and the lower headquarter uh, junior headquarters participate. And so that, that's what the, these rules are designed to do. Uh, we're actually going to put this in a full play and a one coming up in May. We got a couple of rehearsals. So uh, this is one that that we're, we're excited to see how it works out. It allows more people to participate. It allows more uh, briefers at one time instead of a single briefer on each side. If you're going to do a two tier, there's at least uh, two briefers. And then if you do a three tier, the three tier probably be a higher headquarters, which could be that three that we were talking about earlier that would play uh, that you would see in the earlier steps. The S3 then becomes more of a higher headquarters where they have to get permission from the higher headquarters to, to run your, your uh, action. So uh, this is a, we're gonna have a little bit more time on this one in the months coming up. Great, so that's, that's all we prepared. And now we're happy to answer any and all questions. Cause there's, as I mentioned, there's a 90 page rule book. So we really just kind of hit wave tops and then dove, dove a little bit into some things we wanted to provide some detail on. There's a lot more detail that we could provide uh, for those that are interested. Awesome. So right now I'm tracking for questions. Um, if you have additional questions, please let them know in the chat. Please let me know in the chat and I'll go ahead and ask them. Our first two involve scaling. So first is about the scaling of participants and your participant to um, XCON ratio. Do you think there's any room to expand um, outside of, you know, anywhere from I think 16 to 20 players you said on both the red and the blue teams? Um, and if so, what do you think the upper limit would be of, of players for this game? Tricky to know for sure. So we picked eight to 10. I picked it based on my experience with other war games and my experience with the, the predecessor exercise, combined unit exercise about the, how, how big the teams were in that. And I remember being at one combined unit exercise where a combination of number of bodies in the room and personalities, it's, you, you can tell when it starts to feel too big. Uh, and Jim just said they ran one where they, they had 15, 16. And so I'd be curious to see whether it started, you started to feel that it started to be inefficient. At some point, you reach a point of inefficiency where not everybody's going to get a turn to present an action. Not everybody's got something to do to make a contribution in the planning room. Conference rooms start to get too full. So people are spilling out into the hall because they can't actually fit comfortably in work. You can't fit enough workstations in there. One option or there are a number of options when you start to get, so, so say you've got 40 participants in your exercise, all of whom wanna play. 
you could just run two separate war games, or you could run one really big war game with two different maneuver formations, each with their own OPT. Or you could do this thing Jim was just talking about where you have different echelons. You could take half your, your, your blue participants and say, you are the tactical echelon. You can take half your blue participants and say, you are the operational echelon. And you each have different functions and different kinds of things. But I'll, I'll let Jim talk to this because he's had some experience negotiating having slightly more bodies than he wanted to. Yeah, I would say I wouldn't go more than 12, though I've had gone as high as 15. So what happened was I think I think if you're going to run an exercise like this, you have to put a cap on the number of people that you want to come in. Uh, the one we did in, uh, in September, um, we did not do that. And we had a large number of participants, especially from some of our foreign partners, come in to the point where we were seriously discussing running two war games at the same time. Uh, but that is uh, a, uh, it can be logistically hard. Because I then I got to find double people to run it and all that stuff. Then what happened? So we were kind of working on that. And then what happened was uh, uh, COVID came around. Another wave of COVID came in, and so a lot of our participants they started scaling down, but not enough where I could get down to that eight to ten per per team. So it was I had a good chunk of folks there, but not enough really to make two war games. So we kind of forced it in, into one. But I would say just what Chris said there you. It's a space available. You do want everybody to participate. You don't want someone sitting on the back wall, just kind of being an observer. Um, so uh, ideally eight to 10 would be nice. Uh, 12 would be my max, uh, but I think that's more uh, as we go forward at Macaque, being able to manage our numbers and how many people we think will allow to participate in the IWX. Oh, and the, the other part of that question was about the participant to XCON ratio. And I think that's not the way to think about it. It's the, the number of XCON to requ required to run a game. So if you, if you have so many participants that you're running a second, second game, then you basically need double XCON because you're really running two games. And maybe you could get a little quadruple hatting where somebody's, you know, maybe you could use the same judges and have staggered engagement room cycles and get some kind of economy of force. And if you're doing that, if you're doing, okay, we're going to do game one's engagement at, at noon, and then we're going to do game two's engagement at two, the timekeeper could go across to the other game or something. But, uh, but if you, it doesn't matter if you have eight, 10, or 12 on a team, you still have the number of XCON you need to run the game. Whereas, and if you had 15 on the team, just means you have kind of too many players, but you don't need more XCON to wrangle them. It's still the same number of XCON. Now, I will say one thing we did with our teams last time, and it's built in the way we do IWXs, is even though we have a planning team in the first week, because that's really where you kind of get the condensing, we break out separate working groups. We break out an offset working group, and we break out a deception working group so that they have to, they're in their own groups, so but they go back to the main planning team. And then they, they combine their plans into the eventual final plan. So that's one way to kind of break up some of the, the plan initiative if you have too many folks. But that still doesn't relieve you when you get to the actual fighting part of the actual run of the war game. We have too many people in the room. Awesome. So the, the question asker clarified, they were looking more for that answer in, in the um, chat. Not so much about team size, but yeah, definitely that, hey, can people be dual hatted, et cetera? And it sounds like they can. Um, moving along to our question, second question about scaling, which is about the game scaling and game time. Uh, what was the game time of each, I wanna say move, but it's really engagement, presentation, et cetera. How much game time did that real time represent? So there's a whole big section in the rules discussing this. And, and the answer is it can vary. Uh, and it can even vary within a game. So you don't have to say, oh, there's a tactical game. Every turn is going to be eight hours. You can say, oh, it's a tactical game. The six turns are going to take about a week, but turns, turns will vary between, you know, to be about 24 hours or two days. And boy, we had a totally different time scale for the competition game. Jim, you want to talk to that, the, the, the time scale for that? Yeah, so we actually struggled with this quite a bit at the beginning. Um, the first time we ran the tactical game, I think we did it every uh, every 12 hours, and we found out that was that was not satisfactory. That was too fast. 
So the last tactical game we did it, uh, uh, well, we started shaping, which was turn one. And we said, okay, in this particular was seven days out. And then once boots on the ground, it was every 24 hours for each turn. At the operational level, the one that was the competition, uh, we vary that by turn. Uh, the one we did last year, our first one of that, uh, we had, I think it was three days for shaping. And then each move in there was based on a, 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 a event within the game. The one we're looking at now uh, that, that uh, we're looking at the next operational one, we're looking at the shaping being, I think that we're looking about three months prior to the main event. And then the main event covering a couple of turns, we're, we're still working through it. And then the last turn covering like 30 days after the main event. So we're still struggling with this one. But like Chris said, it's uh, that's part of the narration too, is to determine at, at what point does a turn cover, what actions or what events are going to happen in that turn, and then does each turn have to be the same in the amount of length of time? Like Chris said, we don't think it has to be. It really depends on the game you're trying to do. And also the other point is, do you tell the participants ahead of time, the length of time, or do you just like, okay, it's now... X amount of time into the fight, and this is what's happening, and then I'm picking from there. So that's part of the discussions we've had so far, uh, and and we're still working on it. But again, it's I think you'll find or we're finding that depending on the scenario used, each the, the amount of time for each turn will be different, or can be different. Yeah, the the rules do suggest that in step one, that the participants are told, the players are told how long the turn, the actions for the turn have to unfold and how, what, what that span of time is going to represent. But that's a lot of the rules like that are optional, what you tell the players. And then, and we've definitely experienced, yeah, you can, you can vary the length of time represented by each turn without, without injury. So given that the turn time can be variable anywhere from a few hours to even multiple weeks um, in that competition setting, I think this question becomes a little more relevant. Have you considered asking teams to pre-plan future turn actions to emulate synchronizing actions and effects um, and prepare, plan, prepare, influence actions? And if so, is that kind of an additional bonus you give their scoring? So, so a couple of thoughts about that. One is ideally they come out of week one education and planning with a whole plan to support the whole operation. Now, we know that no plan ever survives contact with the enemy, so they're going to have to revise their plan a bunch, but they should have, if, if, they've, if they've been given the time and if they've been, been earnest in using it, they should have, a, okay, you know, here, here's what we think the, the scheme's going to look like. At six turns, we're going to have all these actions. Uh, a second thought is there are rules for ongoing actions. So you have, you have something you start in turn two, and you just keep doing it in turn three, hoping to continue getting the, the same effects. So there's, there's rules in there, in there for that as well. Uh, and the, the cumulative effect, kind of the, if, if you recall flipping back to the scorecard, score there's an assessment of whether the, the action is consistent with the scheme of maneuver. You know, are you, are you saying the sky is red when the sky is in fact green? Or are you saying the sky is green when you have made it green? And, and kind of is the, the target audience predisposed towards the action? So maybe you've, you've laid the groundwork with previous actions that has been moving the needle with a specific target audience, moving their preferences, moving their behaviors. And so you're just continuing to push on that. And, and the, there's structure in the game to reward kind of consistent, effective pressure on a single audience. And in fact, there's a whole bunch of stuff we didn't talk about on will to fight that that talks about that as well you know you may start with an, an enemy force itself that is reasonably resolute but through a series of of kinetic defeats and then different kinds of psychological pressure you might continue to push on their will to fight lower and lower until bam late in the game uh you do something that pushes them over the edge and and change the storyline Jim, anything to add? Okay, our next and our final question 
is regarding participant demographics, um, specifically ranks and familiarity or experience with subject matter, um, kind of what was the mix of players there. And I have a follow-on question, which is, was your mix kind of vari variable by the specific roles you had? Like, was your S3 always a person of this kind of demographic or experience level? Uh, Jim, go ahead. And I, I, because of COVID, I haven't been in the room for any of these. So I, I, I know in general who goes to Cox, but uh, not in specific. Yeah, so uh, the ones that we've run so far, generally speaking, the officers range uh, from a lieutenant to a major. Uh, we haven't had a lieutenant colonel yet, but usually uh, I would say predominantly it, it's, it's, um, it's uh, we do have some lieutenants. We've had lieutenants, but mostly captains and majors. For the enlisted groups, as we do have a mixture of enlisted, uh, generally it's going to be uh, you know, a staff sergeant E6 to, a, to about an E8 that we've seen in that, in that realm there. And I know from from Cox and maybe less during during COVID, but very purple. We get it's not just Marines. We get airmen, sailors, soldiers in there. As Jim okay. mentioned, you get you get international participants. Uh, I, I know from a bunch of the photographs we used, you had a, a bunch of Royal Marine Commando guys. Uh, yeah, so it, it's a, it's so we we do open up the uh, RIWX in the uh, in the fall at the unclassified level, and we do get quite a few partner nations. Uh, we were going to get more. This last time, at one point, we thought we were going to get 60, but that number got reduced. But we still had five separate nations that came in and participated. Same, same thing with the rank structure for them, uh, you know, uh, when it comes to, to that. And we, we have gotten the U.S. Army, the U.S. Air Force. Uh, sometimes you get the Navy, surprisingly enough. But uh, Air Force has really been a big participant over the years uh, in this, along with the Army. Awesome. Well, thank you both Jim and Chris for coming and speaking to us about this exercise, um, answering all of our questions. Always a pleasure hearing about uh, information warfare, in my opinion. I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording in a few minutes. Just a uh, quick reminder for everyone. Next week, we will have John Curry uh, talking about hiding in plain sight, the connection between the commercial and professional world. That'll be on December 7th at a different time and it's going to be noon Eastern time. Um, I know that has been kind of throwing people in the past. So be ready and see everyone next week. Pausing the recording now. <laughs>